United States is one big reservation, and we are all in it. So says Russell Means, the legendary Oglala Sioux actor, writer, and activist. He captured national attention when he led the 71-day armed takeover of the sacred grounds of Wounded Knee. Our crew traveled to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation to talk about the collapsing economy, U.S.-sponsored genocide, and why the American Indian has the lowest life expectancy in the Western Hemisphere. Hello, my relatives. What I have to say about myself is that uh, I've been to prison. I've been a thief. I've been a uh, doper, a dope dealer. And I've also gone to college. I'm an accountant and a computer programmer as well as getting my doctorate in philosophy. I've been everywhere in the strata of white society. I've even hung around with multimillionaires when there were no billionaires. I am an Indian, American Indian. I prefer American Indian to anyone born in the Western Hemisphere is a Native American. I'm an Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Sioux Indian Reservation, which is still designated in the Defense Department as uh, prisoner of war camp number 44. You see, Indian people, we don't have any rights, any constitutional protections on the reservation whatsoever. No freedom of speech, no privacy. Wow, well, you Americans are in the same boat. As far as being an American Indian and a Lakota, I also belong to the Republic of Lakota because a significant portion of my people went, withdrew from the treaties we made with the federal government, the 1851 and the 1868 Sioux treaties uh, and American treaties signed at Fort Laramie, which is now Wyoming but that's in the Republic of Lakota. So when we withdrew from the treaties because of gross violations, according to the laws that the United States of America is signatory to, and we have a strategy for attaining our complete independence and a return for our land. I've written an autobiography, Russell Means, Where White Men Fear to Tread is the title. It's a very thick book, 550 pages, but I'm very proud. I've had 17 printings in 16 years. So people are interested in who we are. And it's actually a comprehensive history based on my family of our existence in the 20th century and the deprivations we went through and the trials and tribulations. And so if you really want to find out about us, read my book, and then you can go to research any place you want to. But you see, the sad thing in America is that we don't exist in the 20th century. You have to specialize in Indian education of some sort, anthropology, history, and then f go and dig in the archives of wherever in order to find out anything about us in the 20th century. So there you have it. You know, the American people for too long have been an irresponsible free people. And even generation to generation as they've become less free, they don't recognize it. They have lost the ability of critical thought. In order to regain c critical thought, all you have to do is read your constitution and then look at the laws that govern you especially from the federal perspective. It's unconscionable to allow your freedoms to be taken away 
decade after decade after decade, year after year. And I'm very proud of this, by the way. My nation, the Lakota, were the first nation to militarily defeat the United States of America on the field of battle. And that resulted in the 1868 Sioux Treaty. Be that as it may, what has happened after they economically forced us into these prisoner war camps by destroying our food supply and our, our, our right of passage in our own land, they confined us to these and then they began practicing and perfecting their colonial tactics. What has happened is now America, because of the irresponsibility of your forebearers and the irresponsibility of yourselves, you are now on a one huge Indian reservation. All policies, all policies were bred and born and birthed on, the, on an Indian reservation and then exported to the world and now comes, comes back on the backs of the American people. You have a near perfect document. In the words of uh, Benjamin Franklin in 1744 to a collection of colonists discussing freedom, he said to them, and I quote, if a nation to the north can form a near perfect union that has endured for centuries, why cannot we form a more perfect union Unquote. So they're talking about the Iroquois Confederacy and that's where the Constitution comes from because in 1988 on the eve of the 200-year anniversary of uh, the Constitution, it was a unanimous thank you by the Congress of the United States. They sent in writing to the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy thanking them for their input into the Constitution and the formation of the United States of America. So you see, the Constitution is Indian law, and that's why I love it. You know, beginning in the 1840s, they start stripping away your freedoms by developing the corporation. You know, a piece of paper, a piece of paper. And then in, in the 1870s, of course, during Lincoln, when they declared martial law, and even after they, they ceased civil war, martial law continued on for another three or four years when it was no need to. And you go on and on, but in the 1870s, that's when Congress started giving the banks the right to rule. And of course, you go on to 1913 and the beginning of the 20th century, that's when they, they officially gave away the power of our economy to the banks, you know? They can print the money for us. According to our Constitution, you should never allow, the people should never allow their money to be printed by someone else. Hello? So the, the history of the Indian and the history of the American have now come full circle and were intertwined in the dictatorial policies of those that control the monetary system of America. And they've, they have done such a bad job of it that they're destroying themselves. <laughs> it's ludicrous at best. What has happened <clears throat> in Indian policy, or I should say American policy now, is that because you don't have control of your money, the international community has refused to invest any more into the financial instruments of America because they know they're worthless, that the United States is too far in debt and cannot cover it. So consequently, they've refused to buy the bonds and the treasury notes, etc. At any rate, the Federal Reserve has been oh, for over a year, way over a year, been printing money 
when no one's buying the, the uh, financial instruments of the United States. So what the Federal Reserve has been doing is buying those federal bonds and treasury notes and then printing more money. <laughs> it's absolute suicide. And it's been proven from empire to empire that when you allow your human right, your individual rights to be usurped, that's when empire grows and, and could care less. I, I, I was growing up when this country, they started emptying this country. Around the 50s, the unions had become so powerful, they were about to form their own political party. They had shown during World War II how powerful they were in the vote for the presidency and the Congress. But they sat down with the bankers <clears throat> and the government around 1950, give or take a year, and they made a deal. The leaders of the unions made a deal with the leaders of America and so sold out the unions. So when the people began to organize and gather and really have some power, it was negated. And it's been negated ever since. Ever since, you know, you have no privacy, none. You have no protections anymore. Now, I could, I could be a smart aleck and say, how does it feel? because I know how it feels living on a reservation, a prisoner of war camp. Now, I can be an American, take my social security card, and leave the reservation, and be like the rest of you. you know, they, they welcome that. Because in America, they had forced relocation for Indian people back in the 50s. It was fostered under Truman, the relocation plan. And the man appointed to run that, the first man, he was the one who headed up the Japanese internment relocation program during World War II. So he went and headed up the relocation office for the American Indians, and we were, I know, I went on relocation twice. That's kind of a con job, but I, know, I made it out twice. And that's what they want to do, a diaspora, and therefore, guess whose land they're after? In our meager holdings on trust land, over 40% of the natural resource wealth of America is still under and on our lands. 40%. It's curious to me that wherever they put us was full of energy from our grandmother of the earth. That's a thought you should think about. So consequently, you know, if we had the right or the rights that you had, you had, we would be richer than the Saudis if we had the right to join in a capitalist society. And we damn sure wouldn't have allowed Wall Street to use our money for derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and enough isn't enough, and they start creating financial mythology, and you allow it. That's the crime. You have no one to blame but yourself. Look in the mirror. If you can't move and protect yourselves, then guess what happens? Look around you. Look at Detroit. Etc. Etc. It's unconscionable what's happening to America. Now, <clears throat> because of the Federal Reserve and the fact that our money is now worthless, this economy in the United States is going to continue to deflate because you have nothing to back it up. You've exported everything that makes a country run. You've allowed that to happen for greed, for your Walmarts, you know, for your Neiman Marcuses, 
for this 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 idiocy of just buy 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 and debt 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 because you've allowed your republic to be commandeered by two political parties whose only differences are their their spending goals you know some would rather have them spend over here and then over there but they still want to spend and it's a government there hasn't literally been been literally no difference in those two parties for quite some time since i would say the civil war all one has to do is look at the results of history and that's proof of the pudding you know it's uh it's very blatant and that's another reason i i fault the american people for not being alert to their own freedoms and to value those freedoms instead it's replaced by politics which guides you into this economics this insane economics of a single party with two names you know there are many efforts at third parties in this country but the two dominant i know i've testified before state legislatures on behalf of third party politics and the idiocy of americans to tell me that if you vote for a third party you're wasting your vote what look at all the parliamentary governments in the world they've pretty much kept industries and everything in their country rather than shipping it out and they've kept and the unions are alive and well there it's a it's a society that is not as materially minded as the americans have and i and i fault that with the reason we've become this so materially uh, minded is because americans don't have a culture they left their cultures behind and you see culture is about values anyone says any different is a democrat or a republican at any rate culture i find is the necessary backbone for value and if you have value you have culture i visited most of the countries in europe and they still had ironworks they still had uh, uh clothing industry made their own shoes etc etc and they still do they also have such a culture as they know how to live in cities in america we don't know how to live in cities getting back to the local if we had local industries then families wouldn't be broken up in the americas i think of only one city that comes close to europe and that would be toronto you know when i went to europe for the first time i was at the world council of churches and it was a breath of fresh air all these white europeans were sitting around me and just their conversations was was refreshing and i got a different look at what white people are all about and it seemed to me immediately that these europeans were a lot more responsible than americans it was immediate here's what here's what it comes down to mob rule 50% plus 1 and then the rest the 49.9% left that disagree have to follow the the 50 plus 1% it, it's idiotic that is not freedom or an expression thereof look at the parliamentary again i mentioned the smallest party 
if it organizes right, can be heard. And they and they go to the car, they go to the capitals of Europe, and your voice is heard, and they build coalitions with it, and all of that kind of stuff. But the point being is your voice is heard. And they're not letting the Federal Reserve print their money. So consequently, all the lies you hear from the corporate media in the United States, you know, they give you Greece. And yet, England is far worse off than Greece. But they don't say anything. It's in America. I think uh, in, in, in the think tank that I belong to, America is ranked the third or fourth worst off country in the world, economically. Your, uh, your leaders have forgotten all about you, so welcome to the reservation. You know, since patriarchy reared its ugly head a little over 6,000 years ago, everything that is structured in the patriarchal world is a pyramid. Everything. The religion, corporations, governments, everything's a pyramid structure. In order to get some sanity back into the world, you have to very simply, go local. In the Republic of Lakota, here's the way we're going. And I'm looking at my ancestors who are responsible, in part, for the Constitution of the United States of America. Why not go to the source? So I look at my people, and there's such a thing as a clan system within the nation. It's built on, it's made on blood, related blood lines. And then there's such thing as sister clans, or you might call in-laws. What those two groups prevent is incest at every level of life, prevents it. It also ensures unanimity. A decision cannot be made unless it is unanimous. In the Republic of Lakota, what we want to do in going local is to form a neighborhoods. The neighborhoods can be two houses, two families. It can be 40 houses. It can be 400 houses. But in that community, when it makes a decision, it has to be unanimous. Remember, mob rule hasn't worked here in America. It's very evident. There's a, there are people in America today that rule that go by that rule. The Quakers, they're alive and well and very prosperous. And the Six Nations people of the Iroquois Confederacy, they're still doing it that way. A good portion of them. There's others that are, have joined you Americans that refuse to accept that type of government. But if you take the time to be unanimous, to understand one another, so that you can forge a unanimous goal, it doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean socialism. What it means is you agree to the end result and you build the ladder needed for that end result. And you do it with patience. Patience is golden, people have said. And that's our simple way. So if you have a neighborhood that just two houses get along, that's fine. If you have a neighbor, neighborhood with 20 houses that get along, that's fine. It doesn't matter the size. Size bigger isn't better. As long as your neighborhood is unanimous. Now think about it. Just take a moment 
to really research that in your mind. What a concept, huh? Do you agree with everyone that it's important to you? That are important to you. So, that's the goal of the Republic of Lakota. Control. Patriarchal societies are after control. They want to control everything. Because you see, when you're at the, at the top of a pyramid, whether you're a CEO, a president, or a king, or whatever, when you're on top of that pyramid, it's precarious up there because people are climbing up that pyramid. They want to take your place, and you know that. So the man at the top is fearful. That's why they have armies. That's why they have police. They're fearful. The centralized America. Let's look at that. Centralized America is like a human body. You have veins going out all over to your extremities. And your extremities function very well. And then disease sets in. And all of a sudden, the blood is not being fed to all these extremities. And the right and the proper nourishment to keep your body free is, is co-opted because, number one, you don't eat right, you don't exercise right, and you don't have a, a feeling of well-being because the psychological is very important. So your body begins to die prematurely. Well, that's the same thing with, with life. Life is organic. And in order for it to be organic, everything has to flow freely. If you over-centralize anything, look at a forest, for example. That is centralized. But what's the first thing you smell when you go into a forest? Decay. Because there's so many trees that are strong and they're up there reaching for the energy of the sun. And then there's the other trees that came later and they're weak and they're searching for the sun, but they're crippled because they can't reach it because of the big trees. And so the forest begins to die. Or you, you look at everything and anything around you and you'll see that Anything that is centralized is wrong. What really blows my mind is you go to school and you learn history, but it means nothing to you because you don't do anything to change it. Another empire rears its ugly head and does the same thing that every other empire has done. They overreach, become greedy, and they become too large for themselves and they can't maintain. Because what happens when you become an empire is you've got to maintain a military. That's the only industry left in America. That's proof positive. Look at the budget of the Defense Department. How do you allow that? We weren't like that when I was born. I was born in 1939. We weren't the world power. There was another empire called Britain. And allegedly, the rise of communism was another empire. Both of those empires are gone, just like the Romans, just like the Egyptians, the Ming Dynasty, Kublai Khan. On and on and on throughout history, the same mistakes over and over and over again. When I was growing up, it was a more libertarian society on its way to extinction, but still it was libertarian. Children were safe. We could go to the playground without adult supervision because we were safe as children. We didn't have to get permission from the school board and get a, a play date with adult supervision. Now children cannot grow up, except in very rural America, without adult supervision. So if you're going to go local, you have to start with your family. What, you know, 
I have a friend who has a son. I have a son the same age. I was visiting in California, and they wanted to go to ride the Ferris wheel at Santa Monica uh, Wharf, and it was just a little ways away, about a half a mile. And I said, go ahead, son. And my, my friend had almost had a fit because his son was going to go alone with my son to go to a wharf. That's, that's fear. A society of fear. Think about it. A society that's upside down, banning smoking in public places in a city, yet they allow the cars to drive back and forth. <laughs> what kind of logic is that? It's insane to live in America now. And America is emptying out. I have friends, and I have friends of friends who are upper middle class, and they're moving to Central America. A lot of them have moved. Some have moved to New Zealand. Some have moved to Australia. But most of that I know have gone down to uh, Costa Rica and Panama. They see the handwriting on the wall for America. And it isn't good because to wrest control of the monetary system from the Federal Reserve will take, I'm sorry to say, a revolution. And America has been through it before a couple times. So, you know, and, th and three times, actually, if you, if you count the union movement, because they revolutionized the people. And whether you like unions or not, there was a time in America when the people, through unions, made their political mark on the ways of America. For instance, the union movement was responsible for the GI Bill, the greatest affirmative action program uh, for white people in the history of America. It's information deprivation. That's what they they're giving us, you know, with the federal school system, no child left behind, and all of that, the dumbing down of America. You know, that's Indian policy. That was born on a reservation in the boarding schools, man. How you dumb down a people in your mode of education. See, I'll give you an example of America as I was growing up again, more, more values here. You know, with local control, you have more honesty. That's, it, that, that's just a rule. Think about it. Local control engenders honesty. When I was growing up, I went through a school system in Northern California, and all of California's public education was considered the finest education in America. And this is in the 1940s and the early 50s. America was considered number one in education in the world. So I am the benefit, I have the benefit of coming from the best public school education system in the world. That's pretty good. Now, the United States of America is ranked 23rd. I know it's worse than, than it's ever been. It's right in the world, you're ranked. And California is ranked 43rd in the nation in public education. Wow, what happened? What happened is you got saddled with Indian education. That's, what, that's how they educated us. They dumbed you down. They're dumbing you down. You know? So there's no value in, in education anymore. It's... It's Indian education. And that's why I call America the largest Indian, the largest reservation in the world. 24% of America, of people who are able to work, are unemployed. That's 24%. And that's being kind with that statistic. That's being kind. I grew up in America when, all of us, when there was no homeless. 
They were hobos. They were bums. I know I used to be a bum on Skid Row. But they're no homeless. And all of a sudden we got a homeless. And it's mostly white people. Uh-oh. That was your first wake-up call. Wait a minute, the homeless is almost all white. It was an issue. Homelessness was an issue. The value of America that I grew up there, they had values for a while because everything was local. The grocers, the small town the grocers, they had to go to the uh, truck where the truck farms trucked in their, their, their groceries. You ate seasonal food. You bought fresh bread every day. Even the corporations would get, take back their bread and you went to their special place downtown where it had day-old bread. Day-old bread. Now there's so many preservatives in the bread, it stays on the shelves of Walmart until it rots or until it's bought. The point is, local control of economics is the only way the human being can live adequately. Because, it, as I said, it engenders honesty. It engenders communication, which brings about honesty. <clears throat> and that's the kind of America I grew up in. It wasn't completely fair, you know, but it was a hell of a, a lot more happier for me at any rate. I wouldn't change a thing in my life, especially my childhood was invaluable to who I am today. And I, it, it, it just saddens me to see America being despoiled by the ruling elite. Understand the patriarchal model of a pyramid, and you understand that as long as that pyramid exists, you're going to end up in the America you have now, and it's only going to get worse. That you, along with your parents, your grandparents, and their parents, sold our rights down the river, man. We have a duty, and you better get real. My duty is to my own people, my local area. And that's why I have the Republic of Lakota. Because I tried to force the United States of America to live up to its own laws. And I couldn't do it. And the American Indian Movement couldn't do it. And all we wanted, we are constitutionalists. It's not a hopeful time unless you grab a hold of the Constitution. It's not too late. It is not too late. Knee on the Pine Ridge Sioux Indian Reservation, also known as Prisoner of War Camp 44. And here's the mass grave of the people who were massacred here at Wounded Knee in 1890. The massacre, of course, is well known among all American Indian people, especially of the United States of America as the signature event of Indian history with the government of the United States. Chief Bigfoot and his people who came here unarmed, running for safety from the military, but they were stopped by the 7th Cavalry The day before Christmas, they were brought down here. They were brought in from over those hills there, and they were camped along. This was a creek then. It's all dried up now, but uh, they put a Hotchkiss gun up there on that hill. You know, the Hotchkiss guns 
fired rounds, about like a 50 caliber. They put them up on the hills over there and up over here. See, then there were no trees. Just brush. And they put a Hotchkiss gun right here. And when it, uh, when the order came, they massacred men, women, and children. Over 300. Then after they mowed most of them down, then the cavalry rode in with their sabers and their pistols, finished the job with the women and children and old people down in those, those ravines and down by the creek. And it was indiscriminate. They used sabers on, on babies and women. They loved to come along and hack. And it was pretty gruesome. Pretty gruesome. Of course, we got the uh, eyewitness stories in detail from the survivors. Bigfoot. ironically was running to keep his faithful people safe from the cavalry and they were all killed instead. This ground is consecrated with our blood. Back in the uh 1800s. Our first contact with uh, with whites were French, French fur trappers and traders. And then a few Scotsmen came in and and others and established trading posts in different areas of our country. That was okay. We got along with everybody. There's room. This is a vast land, there's room for everyone, we thought. And then, to short circuit that, you know, we met government officials prior to our war, but then they found gold in Montana. So the shortcut was right across our land. Well, <clears throat> we didn't mind. People were passing through. Good, you know. There was only one instance of an Indian attack on a wagon train. And all they did was run off the oxen. And what happened was that wagon train was approached by these Indian people. I think they're Pawnees. And they asked for two, two oxen. And they were chased, chased off by, with guns and insulted. And so the Pawnees said, all right, you wouldn't pay the toll. We're going to take all your oxen. And they did. That's the only instance, recorded instance of any confrontation between Indians and wagon trains. But the mythology says otherwise. But then the army, at the insistence of itself, started building forts along what was called the Bozeman Trail. That was the trail to the gold fields. Well, that was, that was going too far. That was contrary to what the United States of America had already promised, and it was contrary to, it disturbed our land. And they didn't have ownership. So we went to war, and we won. The result was the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, and the United States agreed to all, all our demands, every one of them, and, and left. They got as far as Chicago, and then they, they changed some of the treaty. They kind of took about one-third of our land away, away, all of what was in now the state of Nebraska. They cut that because Nebraska was about to become a state, so they uh, 
they cut that portion off in Chicago, went on to Washington, D.C. The treaty was ratified by the Senate and proclaimed by the president, the then president. So these unruly Sioux people, these Sioux Indians, we got to do something about them. So they embarked on the war of attrition on our food source. And here's a staggering statistic that is fact, anthropological and historical fact. At the coming of the white man to the Great Plains, they were estimated approximately 60 million buffalo, a southern herd and a northern herd. That grazed the Serengeti of the North America, which is the Plains states into Canada. That whole area was a, a vast migration of, of natural animals. 60 million buffalo, 60 years later, this was at the beginning of eight, the 1800s. 60 years later, there were 200 and some odd left. That's a million a year killed. That kind of devastation is unknown anywhere else in the world. And that's one of the legacies of the United States of America. And that's what got the Plains Indians to acquiesce. Not just the buffalo, but all that migration that, that represented a food source, uh, a shelter f factory for hides and clothing and, and medicine, I mean real medicine, all of that slaughtered. Because along with the 60 million buffalo and millions of antelope, millions of deer, millions of all types of birds in our gardens. Unbeknownst to almost everybody except the experts, the anthros and the archies and the hissies, you know, the Plains Indians planted food. We had farms, we had gardens. It was that simple. It was real easy to grow things. So then we had to come into the reservations. We were starved into it. Literally starved into it. But when we came in, we came in with pride and dignity. Even though we had been logistically defeated rather than militarily defeated, we became dependent because our food source was gone on handouts from the federal government. Starvation rations. And because of the demoralization of that fact, and the fact that our women were regularly raped, we still stood up. But then the last of the leaders started to come in because they really had no place to go or nothing to eat. Sitting Bull came in with, his, with most of his people. Some of his people refused to come in. They still live in where they stopped, Fort Totten Reservation, and up in Canada at Sioux Valley and on into northern Alberta. Well, we came in, and so they herded us up. And the 7th Cavalry, which had been defeated in 1876 uh, at Custer's sensitivity training session, the United States and, the, and its military forces hold immense grudges. He said what happened at Fallujah. They started... Um, assassinating the leadership, first sitting bull and crazy horse. The last to come in to the reservations and give up their arms. Well, there was a uh, you, uh, Indian leader who was euphemistically called Bigfoot, 
in English. Um, he had his people. Well, the leaders were being, to his mind, systematically uh, assassinated. He headed south with his band of people to come to Pine Ridge and come under the protection of Red Cloud, another leader who defeated the United States Army in 68, 1868, and he got the Fort Laramie Treaty. He was stopped. They had no weapons, because on the reservation, they took away your weapons. It's just like going to prison. They take away your weapons. So uh, we didn't have bows and arrows, I don't think. We had knives. But at any rate, they were stopped right up here on top of the hill from my ranch. And there's a sign up there on the way to Wounded Knee. They were stopped up there. They were searched and all of that kind of stuff, disarmed of everything, and then forced to come down. This is the 7th Cavalry, who still were mad about what happened to them before, even though they deserved it, more so, in fact. Their story, and the Army has to claim this, otherwise they're liable. We're the people who defeated militarily the United States of America, who had built up a string of forts through three states. And we burnt every one of those. He gave them up because we militarily defeated them. Now we're in this bowl, wounded in a bowl, surrounded by the armed might of the United States of America. And we're going to pull out one gun with our women and children and fire a shot. That's what they claim. And people believe it because we're Indians and we don't have a brain. Unlike Americans who have brains, but don't use them. They slaughter us, men, women, and children. And then the blizzard hits and they bury after the blizzard goes by, all the bodies are frozen. And that infamous picture of Chief Bigfoot frozen in, in a horrible way, his body. Then they stack us up. This is before the Nazis and uh, the concentration camps. They stack them up, all our bodies along by this mass grave, and they all take pictures and then shoved him into the mass grave. 1969, we were demonstrating at Mount Rushmore. We went into the tourist shop at Mount Rushmore. And on this whole thing a coat of postcards where they colored in these black and white pictures of the massacre when any all the dead bodies and the pictures of the mass grave and everything. It was, you know, like the Jews. And they colored it in Technicolor. And they were selling these postcards. Oh, we're on vacation. Wish you were here. Love, you know? That's what you put on these grotesque pictures of Indian people. We tore up that shop and we took over Mount Rushmore. Stayed there for a year. Well, unbeknownst to the rest of the world, the death squads were originated and birthed right here on the Pine Ridge Sioux Indian Reservation. The death squads that eventually the the United States exported to El Salvador and uh, now Colombia and other Central and South American countries, you know? Those death squads that they used. Well, the first one was here. And what they did was arm and supply and train a goon squad. A goon squad of... Uh, Oglalas, who were under the personal guidance and protection of the uh, president of the Oglala Sioux tribe, the reservation. 
He was the lackey the U.S. government used. And after we took over the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., and then left there without anyone getting arrested, we took it over for seven days during election week in November of 72. And then uh, we came back here and they thought AIM was going to attack the Bureau of Indian Affairs here. So they brought in a squad of 80 marshals in their paramilitary squad and they put them up on, on the roof of the Bureau of Indian Affairs building and guarded it while we decided in, under our traditional chief's direction to come here instead of attacking that. And we did. We came here that night of the 27th of February, 1973. There was a trading post right over there with a house beside it. And there were other houses over here where they, they all lived. These are the traders, the, the white people. And we took that over, and then we, we took over the church that was in front of the graveyard, and we held this ground, all the bowl. You see, it's like a bowl here. And the feds put all their guns up on these hills above us, all around. And for almost every day, for 72 days, they poured in fire. And they even used 50 calibers on us which is illegal, according to the Geneva Convention. But what the hell, we're Indian. So uh, we actually didn't believe we were going to come out of this alive. They, they agreed to our demands, and within 35 minutes after we stood down our arms, they violated every, they started violating every one of those terms they agreed to. So we learned the hard way, just like our ancestors, you know? can't believe a white man. They lie, especially if they work for the government. Over 260 court cases and we won every one of them. Once we were inside Wounded Knee, we reformed the independent Oglala Nation. We reinstituted our, our philosophy of life. And it ruled by unanimous consent, we kept everything here. We had to, we were surrounded. But it's just an example of local control. If you have local control of the economics, if you have local control of the foodstuffs, if you have local control of uh, your travel and transportation, you have freedom. And your freedom to act as neighbors, you know, you don't need government because you have each other. It's, it's a simple, simple way of life, but I guess it's too profound for, for Americans. So I'm reminded of where I stand constantly, even in Hollywood. You know when you're a writer and you're going to write something? All responsible writers research it. You write a script. You're going to write about gangsters. You do some research on gangsters. You don't just make it up. And you do research on labor movements, whatever the topic on love. Except when it comes to Indian. Script writers do no research. I know. I've confronted them. I've acted in some of their TV and movies. So I know where my people stand in America, you know? But this is my land. I love it. 
and it's governed by Indian law. Ironically, isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful in my eyes. So I love this land and I'm sad to see it's my duty as a Lakota to welcome human beings. So that's why I fight for this country. That's why I fight for the Constitution. That's because I see too many wounded knees. The Branch Davidians, it's a white man's wounded knee, you know? When Clinton, a Democrat, attacked his own people and slaughtered them. Wow. Never stops, does it? And then they're demonized. And you know what they went to prison for? Those that survived that Holocaust? Illegal possession of firearms. The reason um, for sterilization is that usually is visited upon tribal people people who still lean towards matriarchy, people who are organized in a socioeconomic way of life that is counter to the existing paradigm. And those are the people they pick on to sterilize. You know, at the same time in America, when in a uh, four-year period, they sterilized 42% of our women, American Indian women. At that same time, they, they sterilized 35 or 36% of the Puerto Rican women in Puerto Rico because there was a groundswell of liberation movement in Puerto Rico that was getting way too big. And I guess one of the methods they employed to stop that besides prison and uh, deprivation of your individual rights, um, they sterilized Puerto Rican women at, at the same rate, almost the same rate, during the same time period. And, and you know, that was, that was never really brought forth, except by us Indians. We're the ones who found it out. But uh, that's my answer to the fact that uh, the dominant society is fearful and always has been of matriarchal indigenous groups. And those are the ones they always want to control the population. And you go around the world, the Ainu north of uh, J Japan, the original indigenous people of Japan driven to the northern islands, um, the Sami people of, of uh, Scandinavia, commonly referred to as Laplanders. And you just go on, the indigenous people of Africa, the massive sterilization down there, the massive uh, slavery, my God. Um, it all started with the Arabs, you know, when they started enslaving uh, Africans way back when. So it's, it's continuous, continuous attack on indigenous people the world over. You know, they talk about the bio, whatever it is, the bio food, the pharmaceutical, all the corporations. You know, it, it, it's just one word, it's greed. They've set up a system, <clears throat> and, and the American people are the laboratory. They set up a system, what's the best way for our industry to profit? Well, we've got to have sick people. They go to the scientific community in league with the government to okay all of these uh, drugs that can kill you. What's unbelievable is they advertise, they advertise these drugs as lethal. And people still buy them. Huh? That, along with the Social Security, I mean, what are Americans? Man, 
What happened to their brains? Well, I know it's the educational process is a lot large, but I think these foods, these foods, I'm convinced that an entire people that do not want to say anything about defending their rights, that don't do anything to stop the continual deprivation of their individual freedoms, it has to be also in the food and in the medicines, along with everything else, because no, nobody's that stupid. To see these uh, TV commercials on med supposed medicines that they tell you is lethal. Well, you know, if, if your liver goes bad, immediately call your doctor, or whatever they say on there, you know. It's unbelievable the situation Americans have allowed themselves to be put in, and they still do nothing. They still do nothing. Uh, every issue you can think of. But this food thing and this drug thing, everyone knows that a, a, a McDonald's hamburger is a killer. Everybody knows all of this food is, is bad for you. And they even print it on the side, aspartame. All of that is on the label. And if you don't know what's good for you, what kind of person are you? Because you have children, you know, and you were a child once. But to, to read those labels, or not read them, but they tell you on there that there's poison in the foods and that still nothing changes. Um, this reservation is a perfect example. You can't talk to people on this reservation not to eat meat. They think they've been convinced that we were a meat-eating people, which we're not. Indigenous people don't have refrigeration. You can't be a meat-eater if you don't have refrigeration. I mean, it can be part of your diet, but it's damn sure not, not a major part. It's, it's just mind-boggling the, uh, the hold these corporations have on America through the media. You don't even have a court system to back you up anymore. There used to be the Sherman Antitrust Act. There used to be uh, food and drug laws all washed away by politics, by Congress. When I was growing up in America, we had one forced inoculation. Every kid had to get a smallpox inoculation. And not only did that shot hurt a lot, but it got infected, it got pussy. It's supposed to do that. And in my little mind, I thought that was wrong, just wrong. Making you all sore and pussy and infected to make you better? I, I, I couldn't wrap my mind, my little mind around that, that it was good for me. So having had that experience and then, then finding out when I started having children and <clears throat> I'm 72 winters old, and I have children that are now half a century old, and, <clears throat> um, and young all the way down to 19. So I've had a series of growth through the school systems where more, more inoculations with each, each decade of my kids. <clears throat> and it's, got, it's gotten horrible. When I, my last two, they were born in uh, one, 85 and, and the next one in 91. <clears throat> when they were born and became a school age, I didn't want them getting inoculated. And I found out they couldn't go to school unless they were inoculated. I didn't have the wherewithal at that time to homeschool and my wife and the mother of my children. She wouldn't <clears throat> homeschool them. She was in complete disagreement along with her parents. So I acquiesced 
to allow him to be. And then when my last child was born in 91, I was vehemently against uh, him being inoculated and I wanted to homeschool him again. And then I was at the position where I could. Uh, and again, I lost out to the in-laws. So <clears throat> I'm well aware of those inoculations. And what scares me about those inoculations is the fact that I think that goes in large part to the dumbing down of America. I think it, it does something to your brain uh, that shuts an important valve off, one of self-worth or something. Because if you look at America, it's, it's becoming one huge sick society. And I mean physically sick and mentally sick. And the proof in the pudding, I think, are the elections. It's just unbelievable that they have no choice and they don't realize it. You know, what, what gets me is that the gall of, of Obama going around campaigning for, of course, other Democrats. But what was he campaigning on? He promised change and he, he didn't change the damn thing. You know, it's more lies upon more lies and the American people don't wake up. It's, uh, it's unbelievable that after 2006, anti-war demonstrations disappeared. Well, you know, because of what the United States did with Indian people, America then became the role model subsequently for Hitler's treatment of gypsies and Jews and, and uh, Poles and gays and homosexuals. And then South Africa adopted the reservation system and apartheid um, because of the example of the United States. This is all written history because Hitler wrote about it when he was still in uh, Austria. So uh, that the United States of America knows how to treat the lesser human being. I forget how he put it, but the human beings that do not deserve equitable treatment. So, <clears throat> unfortunately for the other peoples that suffer, um, America was the role model for concentration camps. I know the Japanese did it, and you know, the Japanese were not treating American soldiers or any prisoners badly until the United States, and this is a little known fact, the United States started sending the Japanese to concentration camps in, uh, in western United States. So uh, that too is fact factor. It's not an unknown tactic about the scorched earth policy. I mean, that was done throughout empires. Um, in fact, that's how you rewarded the soldiers keep them fighting. They got all the loot and the women that uh, they could, you know. So um, Sherman's tactic in the South wasn't new, very effective. It's called terror. Uh, and so he came out West to try to employ that same thing, but he failed. And it was one of his lieutenants that uh, called the Lakota, my people, the finest light cavalry in the world. Uh, we were too, too mobile, um, the Plains Indian, for Sherman to be successful. The whole railroad system was dependent on a, a safe throughway through the Plains. And the Plains Indians were, for lack of a better term, nomadic. Um, because of the Serengeti, or the plains of, of America, of North America. So, 
that I definitely had a, a part to play in uh, the dream of the ra uh, railroad barons and the industrialists of America. And also, you know, the, the imperial reach of America, because they were definitely, they needed to connect the West Coast with the East Coast in order to grab a, a, a hold on, on America. And they, and of course, most of America was done illegally. You see, the Louisiana Purchase wasn't a purchase, except for the fact that what they purchased from the French was the right to negotiate with the Indians, free of any interference from France. Doctrine of Discovery had already claimed that. So according to the Catholic Church and all international law, they own the Louisiana Purchase. But all they sold to the United States of America was New Orleans. And then some of Louisiana, most of that Delta, but what the, then the rest of the Louisiana Purchase was uh, their right to negotiate in fair and equitable treatment with, with the Indians. Of, of that purchase. So them claiming the Louisiana Purchase as, as a land grab, it was a land grab, you know, illegal land grab. They never bought Alaska from Russia. They bought the five ports, trading ports. That's what the United States bought. That's why it was necessary for them as the Alaskans got educated and said, hey, you don't own this land. So they passed the Alaskan Native Land Claim Settlement. Because there was the, it's the natives up there, the Indians, the uh, uh, Inupiats, and the uh, Aleuts. And, uh, and so they, uh, they owned Alaska. So in the 1970s, I think, 72, or whenever they passed the Alaska Native Alaska, that was to finally own, the United States finally own legal title. And that's contested to Alaska. The Imperial March of America, uh, you know, it was Thomas Jefferson who said America should be... Uh, should reach the entire Western Hemisphere, and failing that, at least to the Isthmus of Panama. The thing about George Orwell is that he wrote a book to be entitled 1948, and it's supposed to be factual. He immediately saw what the net result of television was going to be and become. So he wrote a book, 1948, about the massive uh, control television would put upon the American people. Well, his publisher said, look, this book will never sell. You've got to fictionalize it and, and create another title. So he inverted it to 1984, and he, and he wrote his book, as we all know, 1984. Well, television became that. And a good training ground for the subsequent generations to be, um, to have the intention span, you know, of a gnat. And so now you've got, it's amazing to me, big is better, and I've watched society go from uh, widescreen movie things to widescreen TV. Except the younger generation doesn't pay that much attention to TV anymore. They're going small. Now, it's unbelievable to me that society not watching movies on a telephone and, and playing games on these little devices with a small screen when all, all the time in America, big is better. Wow, what a transformation. But nevertheless, it's even more so now the largest part of entertainment industry is video games now, and, it, and it's outpaced movies, everything, TV, and it, it brings you further remote. So how, what does uh, the government do? It brings you in to use Jones, another video game, except this is real life.
killing life. Uh, I don't understand it. The, uh, the fact that TV now controls whatever the form, whether it's on your little handheld device or uh, on the big screen, it's all about a uh, fantasy world. And, uh, and that's what everybody's hooked on now, is fantasy world. It's, it, it's even gone beyond 1984 in its completeness. And I do believe um, it's like a mass hypnosis. I, I, I don't get it. You know, what the patriarch doesn't understand is natural law. Natural law is what you go by. In order, in order to conduct your life as a human being, you have to learn what's around you. That's natural law. Learn about the trees. Why do the leaves fall? Not scientifically, but naturally. What happens when they fall? Well, of course, you go down there where the leaves fall and you'll smell decay. They're decaying, but at the same time, they're fertilizing. And if you watch the, the land, you'll see all this plant life. But the poison plants have no friends. Look at all the friends here. They all, they all coexist with one another, with the bees, with the birds, with the worms, with the snakes, the gophers, prairie dogs, everything. The elk, the antelope, the grasses, the bushes, all coexist to help one another. You get to a poisonous plant, and it has no friends. It's bare all around the poisonous plant. So that's natural law. So you can, you can blend in with anything and everything that is around you if you're friendly. And you share and you sacrifice. You're willing to sacrifice. That's what you can learn from just plant life. And if you're a poisonous person, you're not going to have any friends. Period. So why be that person? Natural law. The air, the wind. You know, we had 50, we still have, 52 names for clouds. In this part of the world, there's 52 different kinds of clouds that come. If you know the names of those clouds, then you know your way. You can tell the weather up to four days. The clouds coupled with the wind, whichever the wind is coming. That's natural law. What also is natural law is that everything that is round is sacred. Everything that is sacred is round. The raindrops, the leaves, you and I, all life is round. Even the wind is round. Wind travels in a circle. So do the clouds. The sun and the moon and the stars are all round. So that's a lesson right there. Natural law. You watch an animal. And you realize, you know, there are no predators. There's only natural law. And we, human beings, we don't want to be eaten. It's that simple. That's natural law. We don't want to be eaten. So every bit of what life can teach us 
we incorporate for our own survival. For instance, watching the coyotes. Coyotes hunt in pairs, man and wife. When they select out a buffalo, for instance, they don't chase the buffalo. Oh, they chase it minimally, but they chase it in a circle. They make it go in a circle. And then when it gets too tired, they kill it, eat it. Well, that's why we hunted buffalo. We didn't ride our BMWs across hill and dale. Look at these plains, man. If you're going to ride a horse you trained seven, eight years, you're going to ride them over hill and dale. You don't know where a hole is or a big rock or cactus or anything. And then you chase that beast say, over the hill and you're camped out here and you kill it over the hill. Who's going to go get it? That's a ton of meat, man. No, you, you, you follow the, the coyote. And we run the buffalo in a circle, kill it, and we're all right there. And we can enjoy the meat and the hide and the fur and the tongue and the hooves and the head and the skull and the tail. Every bit means something to us, has value to us. Natural law is the four seasons. How do you live in the four seasons? Well, we built what is called a teepee, a home. It's one of the finest archite architectural designs of, of buildings in the world. In fact, it's the best because it doesn't need a foundation. The teepee poles, weight is on each other. Then you put the hide around there and you add to the weight, but the weight is on the poles, not dependent on the ground. And so it's, it's conical shape. So when the wind comes, it immediately goes off around it because it's round, man. So you're safe from high winds. And it also spiritually means something, the home. It, it's a teacher every day because the teepee represents a woman. You know, those flaps that you call flaps, and they have this, the uh, teepee poles in the flaps, and they're out like that. Well, at night, you fold in the flaps like this. See, that's how a woman takes care of you. She keeps you warm, safe. The door is very small. One, to keep out the wind, but mainly to teach you to be humble. See, you have to bend down to enter the home. So that, that's a little lesson right there. The teepee poles, when they're up there tied together like that, they represent the men. And when the men are tied in unity, nothing can bring them down. Nothing. Not even an earthquake. Americans have become so greedy, as we know, that they're trying to, first of all, they print money without any value. And they continue on this hocus-pocus search for, for wealth that's, that's based on, on, on air. And one of the ways they do it is, as we know, they use Social Security and your number to, to finance their debt way into the future. So that's why it's mandated that every person born in the United States of America has to have a Social Security number, you know, even before their name is registered. So because they're going to be indebted for the future debt that this society has incurred. The United States and its various agencies, um, the governments even, are using people to raise money and trade. As we know from the Social Security system that everyone born and has to have a Social Security number or you can't 
get anything. In fact, your parents can even go to jail if they don't get a U.S. Social Security number. Now, with the Indians, not only do we have a Social Security number for that area of indebtedness, but <clears throat> our reservation and all its value, including the people on it, not only are we indebted on the Social Security number bit, but we're also future the state attorney general of the state of South Dakota and all the other states that have Indian reservations. They trade that reservation and the value of that reservation and the value of its people, the value of its air, the value of its carbon emissions are traded on Wall Street and Dun and Brad, through Dun and Bradstreet. It's listed. This value is put into financial instruments that are packaged and repackaged just like the real estate fiasco. So we haven't even hit on all the swindles that Wall Street is visiting upon the people of America. You're nothing but a bunch of coupons for the United States government and the people who run it. That's it. American people, you're a commodity and you don't deserve anything else. And they're going to make sure you continue to be a commodity as long as the empire exists. As long as you allow the Constitution to be raped. This uh, this land now filled with Indians that are absolutely dependent on the government for everything, for everything. At any rate, you depend on the government. And what you'll end up with is poverty and a lot of paper. Because everything you do, the government requires a lot of paper. You have to fill out a lot of forms. Then they have to fill out a lot of forms. And then they go up to the next level of government, they got to fill out a lot of forms. And by the time it gets to where it's supposed to go, nothing happens. We have government health here. Our life expectancy, if you, if you don't count AIDS, is the lowest in the world. Here. We are worse off than people in Haiti. Not only physically, but of the heart, our spirit, our reason to live. No, you don't want the government taking care of you. I do not speak untruths. Our land held in trust by the federal government, so we can't get loans, so we can't get businesses. That's some more paperwork you have to apply for. Our casino? The money goes first to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, then we have to write proposals to utilize the money. It's a never-ending cycle of poverty, dependency on the government. And in order for you to get ahead, you have to be like a congressman. You have to take bribes. You have to steal money, taxpayers' money. So America is no different than this Indian reservation. You're dependent on the government now, and you're getting what you deserve. But every time you try to get away from the government, they'll kill you. Or put you in prison. Or let you become an American. <laughs> 
if you catch my drift. Because you're the new Indian. You're the new American Indian. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. But this land is beautiful. It belongs to us. And we should learn to take care of it by fighting for her. She's worth it. And so are we. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want. Mm -hmm.